Good morning, Discovery. Uh, as Ecom pointed out, that music is really for the planning shift because we're going to have to stay and finish the execute package. Uh, good morning, Mark. Uh, and to the planning shift, we were hoping maybe that it meant for us that we'd stay a little bit longer, but uh, too bad for you guys. I hate to break it to you, Kurt, but we're still talking uh, nominal mission duration, but uh, great to be with you again. Well, we'd just like to welcome everyone to the mid-deck of the Space Shuttle Discovery. Uh, we're on our 124th orbit around the Earth since our launch last Thursday. We, uh, the mission has been going great. We've uh, completed uh, eight days of intense payload operations. Uh, the K folks at KSC has given us a great vehicle in Discovery. She has uh, operated flawlessly for the last eight days. And just to let you know where we are, we're currently 160 nautical miles above the surface, surface of the Earth, and we're in the South Pacific, and during the press conference, we'll be press, passing across South America and Northern Europe. And JSCPO, we're ready for questions. This is Marcia Dunn of the Associated Press uh, for one or more of the rookies. I'm wondering what your biggest surprise about space flight has been so far, and I'm thinking more of the day-to-day -day stuff, not necessarily the scientific experiments. Steve Robinson, I'm a rookie, and uh, <laughs> I think one of the biggest surprises has certainly been the uh, uh, how much fun and how how initially awkward it can be floating around in uh, in in the free fall situation that we have here, and and also how efficient it can be for storing things. It's been uh, uh, it, I'm really going to miss that when we get back on Earth. And I'm Robert Kirby, and I think uh, the biggest surprise for me was just. Uh, how the day-to-day -day activities change, you know, getting getting up in the morning and, and washing and getting ready for the day is a lot different here in space, obviously. There are things that, you know, that we kind of take for granted when we're in gravity, like spit out your toothpaste and it always goes. So that doesn't happen here, so uh, you do that a little bit differently. And, and the whole morning routine changes tremendously, and that was the biggest surprise for me. Uh, behind the trick with him. Uh, I guess what I would add to that is after about five or six days up here, you get kind of uh, used to the uh, funny attitudes up here where up can be anywhere and down can be anywhere and get used to uh, working upside down and whatever. And uh, it feels kind of natural after five or six days. Japanese uh, investigators say this is the last space test of the uh, MFD. And I'm wondering, do you think it's ready for when it flies next time on the International Space Station? Could you sort of give a, a report card, please? Oh, I'd give it an A+. plus. It's uh, really been fun for Steve and I to fly the arm through all the different uh, scenarios that we have, and it's performed very well, and there are some things we really could not even test on the ground, some of the compliance functions, that, and we sort of feel like test pilots up here trying out the arm, and we have uh, taken it to the edge of its envelope and tested every possible mode, and I think we have a lot of good data, and uh, we still are learning a lot about it, and we'll be ready for International Space Station. This is Seth Borenstein from the Orlando Sentinel. Actually, Jan, can, if you can keep this, just, just to follow up on that question, uh, there have been, so, you know, you've had little problems with the computer commands, and you've had sort of stop and go with the arm. Has that at all been frustrating or annoying, um, or, or is it something you just really don't even uh, notice that much? Well, we certainly notice it uh, when when something happens like that. But uh, as I said, this is sort of a test flight of this hardware, and it's performed very well. And in the compliance mode, 
the flexible compliance mode is something we can't test uh, in 1G in the gravity of Earth. And so that has really been where we've, we've had the surprises. So we, we really uh, didn't know what to expect there, and the fact that we, we had to uh, play with ARM a little bit more to get it to do what we wanted to do really uh, was not a worry to us. It's something that uh, was kind of interesting to, to see how the different compliance modes worked. As far as the ground commanding, uh, that went very well most of the day. We only missed one run at the end uh, when we, we lost the computer lock. So we proved that the ground commanding works, and I think that was really uh, a real triumph to command the arm from the ground, and uh, that really proves that we'll be ready for that for International Space Station. So the few little glitches we've had, I think, uh, really uh, proved that the system works well and the surprises that we have had are understood, and uh, we certainly can, can work on those and uh, be ready, as I said. And one for uh, Kurt Brown there. Uh, there's a long streak now going this year and into much of ne last year for first day landings, uh, first attempt, you know, first day attempt landings at KSC with very few uh, uh, diversions to California. Do you feel under pressure that uh, you're going to have to land uh, here at KSC on the first day? And and why do you think it is that uh, uh, shuttles keep um, aren't being waved off for weather much and landing on the first first try now? Well, probably the uh, the pressure's not on me. It may be on Mission Control. They do all the, the real re weather investigation prior to giving us a go for the orbit burn. But uh, we obviously trust their judgment quite well, and, uh, and we'll be ready to go wherever they send us. Um, I don't want to say we're just lucky, but uh, obviously every shuttle landing that we do, we always look at the weather very, very strongly so that we understand what it will do within the uh, next hour or so after the burn. So uh, we have to give a lot of credit to our space meteorology group they do a great job at looking at the weather and forecasting it, and uh, I think they're they're just that good. If they give us a go for the orbit, we can we can come on in there. Pete Galtieri with the West Kentucky News uh, for Briarney. Um, as a principal investigator on the uh, the MIMS, uh, I was wondering if you could comment on the uh, the status and the effectiveness of both uh, the units that are now on orbit, and in particular uh, how the Mir unit uh, is uh, its results have impacted on what you did uh, on shuttle. Well, the uh, <coughs> unit of Mir has been up there for about a year, and we've learned a fair bit from that. And on basis of those results, we actually adjusted the design of this one a little bit to improve on that. And in the data that I sent to the ground from this unit, uh, the folks on the ground report back up that we've got about a four to five improvement in the performance of this system. We, and that's largely because of the small changes we've made in the design of the system. Uh, this has been for me reasonably well. We've been surprised by a couple of things that we're dealing with. And we had one uh, maintenance issue that we've uh, solved, I think, now, and we're in operation here again. Uh, but the units are performing quite well. I think they certainly improve the vibration environment for experiments uh, of the type that we're going to do in the next few years on the uh, space station. Uh, with all these uh, icy comets coming into the atmosphere, uh, I know I know they're not ice by the time they reach your orbit, but uh, they're water vapor. Is it going to be possible to, to see if you guys are flying through water vapor, or can you any test or, or, or whatever to, to, to determine this? Well, that's a good question, and uh, this is a brand new theory about uh, icy snowballs pelting the Earth from uh, from deep space and possibly a source of water uh, uh, on the Earth's surface, or at least hydroxyl in the Earth's atmosphere. Where we are now, 160 miles out, we're well above uh, the Earth's atmosphere, and so we don't expect to find uh, water or any comp components of water up where we are. But uh, we have deployed the Krista Spa satellite and the Marcy instrument uh, on that satellite. And both the Krista and the Marcy are taking detailed explorations uh, at the middle atmosphere and making new discoveries uh, since we put it out about eight days ago. And uh, one of one of the uh, very interesting bits of data that's come in, and this is very fresh data, so it hasn't really been analyzed to its fullest extent is that there is a large amount of hydroxyl, which is a component uh, that's both involved in water being atmos in the atmosphere and also is uh, one of the major uh, players in the destruction of ozone in the atmosphere. So it's important to know about hydroxyl. 
and uh, there's a lot of it in the middle atmosphere, between about 40 and 60 miles. We need to learn more about that, and uh, I think the Christus Spas and Marcy instruments out there right now are going to tell us a lot more about how much water is there and give us a lot to think about where, about where it may have come from. And Commander, can you tell me, wh what's the proudest accomplishment of this flight as you see it for you and your crew? Well, I'd probably have to say the uh, spectrum of the activities we have on board and the number of activities we have on board. As I mentioned in the opening, we've completed eight days of very uh, intense payload operations, and all those have gone very smoothly. We've had a few things that slow us down. We've gotten behind in the timeline a little bit, but due to the uh, extraordinary efforts of the folks on the ground, we're able to blend those back in into the next day's activities, so we, uh, we're right where we should be. So I. I have to be very, very proud of, of my crew doing all that. With three rookies on board, they have to adapt to spaceflight first and then work the, uh, the uh, payload operations, and they've done an excellent job of that. And, uh, and with all the activities we have, it's going to be a, one of the shuttle missions that we can look back and be very, very, very proud of. And uh, I guess one for uh, Kent Rominger, since he's kind of lonely there. Um, are, aren't you going to be doing much of the... Uh, rendezvous activity tomorrow and can you take us a, a few through a few steps of what's going to happen yeah and the uh, the rendezvous is actually a team effort with all of us on board uh, in particular obviously uh, commander kurt brown myself and then uh, robert kirby have done the primary amount of training for the rendezvous but the uh, rendezvous will start uh, actually be before we get in the rendezvous checklist which is four hours about five hours before the actual grapple of the satellite. Even before that, some of our burns will be, begin phasing us to close back in on Christus Paz. And Christus Paz is approximately uh, 35 miles behind us right now. We're out in front of it. And we do some phasing burns to uh, raise our orbit to slow us down relative to Christa and let us close on it. We actually hop over the top of Christa and do a, a full circle loop all the way back around it. And we stop and come up from below for a while and then continue that first full circle loop back around to being out in front of it again where we started, except this time we're only 300 feet out in front of it instead of 30 miles, and then we close on into that final grapple.